In 1981, my father was assigned to be the military attaché, the, the military representative in the U.S. Embassy in Mogadishu in Somalia. And for two years, that was his day job, what he did all the time during the week. But because he was also a priest, this is sort of his second career, uh, he went there with that part of his life as well. And as you might imagine, Somalia being off on the edge of Africa and the edge of the world in a way, uh, there were no other Anglican clergy of any sort in Somalia. He was the only one in the entire country. He was called the Archbishop of Sudan's chaplain for Somalia. He had a whole country for his parish. Now, of course, there was no actual parish there at the time. There was no church. There were no, no vestry, no congregation, all that kind of stuff. It was all very much a pickup sort of affair. Uh, and because it was no building, they had to find some place that they could meet. Uh, but because Somalia had been an Italian colony once upon a time, there were Catholic churches. And it turned out that one of these Catholic churches was led, overseen by a Franciscan priest. And Franciscans are well known for their love of not following the rules. And so Father Giorgio was more than happy to let this Anglican group meet in his church and have its worship on Friday or Saturday, whichever the day of the Muslim weekend they met to do church. And because it was a Catholic church, as is the case in virtually every Catholic church everywhere, there was an image of the Blessed Virgin Mary in the church. Some places it's a statue, other places it's a painting. Uh, there's some very lovely ones. You go around the world and see how different cultures have interpreted this image. The one that was in the church in Mogadishu looked like a Somali woman holding a Somali child. And when, two years later, my parents left Somalia, his congregation, my dad's congregation, got together and found a painter who would make a copy of that painting to give to my parents as a gift when they left. And that is this painting here. Uh, as kind of a sad end to that story, about 10 years later, when Somalia had descended into the chaos that it continues to be in even today, I had, in one of my first jobs, occasion to look at uh, aerial photography of, of Mogadishu. And I could see where this church was, and all that was left of it was a ruin. The belly had no roof. There was nothing left. And so it's quite likely that this is the only record left of that image that was in that church in Mogadishu. And so it has been precious to my family. It has been carried around from house to house, from country to country ever since then. And now, as my mother is downsizing her apartment yet again, uh, I have taken it on. And I cannot even imagine not keeping it wherever I am from here on. What a lovely piece of the past to have. Now, it may seem like I'm, I'm belaboring this story for the sake of nostalgia, but I do actually have a point, a theological point in this. It relates to what we're doing in Lent as we think about our own story and the story of God that we're hearing as we go through these weeks. I went to a seminar a few years ago on uh, a word that we don't like to say in church, in Episcopal churches often. The word is evangelism, sharing our faith. And in fact, the seminar was about how we can help people to be better at doing that, to not be so nervous about it, to not be so worried how other people will respond. And what they did was they told us that it's really about telling stories and helping to connect stories. The image that the person who taught it gave us was that in every story there are at least three stories. There's my story, what I'm telling about me and my experience. There's our story, and there's God's story. And if we'll look for all three of those pieces in the story, we'll begin, I think, to see what it is God intends us to learn and what it is God intends us to do. I mean, turning back to the painting, you can see all three of those. The, the my story in it is the, the object that we've been carrying around all these years. This, this literal, physical thing that has been a part of our lives that reminds us of where we have been. And there's the, the our story. Imagine this, this teenager growing up in Palestine who has a child who had never knew anything much beyond her own village, let alone someplace halfway across the world in Africa, and yet who has gone around the world into every Christian corner of the world and been interpreted in that culture's way. 
somehow the Blessed Virgin Mary strikes a chord with everybody wherever that story is told, wherever her story is told. And how lovely that when that story came to Somalia, when her story came to Somalia, it was interpreted in a way that Somalis could recognize. It occurred to me when I was talking about this at 8 o'clock that, in fact, it probably was a story that Somalis could recognize too. A poor woman who had a child who lived with very little, who lived sort of a migrant life, you can see in the picture the, 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 the huts that the, the herdsmen will take apart and put on the backs of their camels when they go from one place to the next following their flocks and their herds. Flocks and herds, shepherds, brings you back to Christmas immediately, doesn't it? There was something about that story that I think really connected for them in a way that it connects for us, but perhaps not in so immediate and organic a way. And then there's God's story somehow this message of God coming among us is meant for absolutely everyone, everywhere, and is to be proclaimed in a way that everybody can understand. And how lovely that that symbol was there and now travels with me, with us, and continues to remind us of what it is God intends for all of us. Ultimately, it is God's story that enlightens, enlivens, our story. We see this also in the stories this morning in the readings. First we hear of Noah. We don't get the whole story. We only get the last little piece of it. We miss some important stuff that happens earlier. Isn't that kind of cool? Yeah. 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 Am I now talking only with my outdoor work? Apologies for that. I will speak on the stuff that can. Apologies for those who are joining us on the internet. That's for some reason my battery is pretty much. You recall the beginning of ah, you recall the, the beginning of the Noah, Noah story. Noah is the crank. He's the guy living on the edge of the community who is rejecting all of that drinking and, and eating and debauchery that his neighbors are doing. He's off on the edge building a boat for heaven's sake. How odd must he have looked doing that when it hadn't even started raining yet? His story was about the message he had gotten that somehow he had to save his family and he was going to do whatever he had to do in order to make that happen. So he's building his boat. At the same time, in there is our story, the story of the way that we have engaged with creation, our stewardship or our lack of stewardship for creation that has led us, often leads us into doing things that are not exactly godly with what it is God has given us. Certainly we as modern people are much more aware of that, I think, even than our ancient ancestors where it were, of how much our footprint is on God's creation and how possible it is, how terribly possible it is for us to wipe out absolutely everything if we really set our minds to it. And then there's God's story. God so loves creation that God will not let any one piece of it destroy any other piece of it. If, if nothing else for modern people, that should be a worrying message. That God loves all of creation and no part of it more than any other. In there somewhere is also a message about revolution. That somehow the only thing God can think to do to save creation is to wipe out at least a piece of it and start over again. And yet that is the story of, that, that comes through to us to the end of the piece we heard read this morning. God has done what God has done, promises that won't happen again. And yet God still is proclaiming God's love for everything and everyone. It's a story about truth in a way, and yet certainly we can look at it and say it. it's not likely that there's any literal truth in this story. But nonetheless, it's a way of making truth. It doesn't have to be literally true in a New York Times sense in order to make truth. We don't have to read in the paper, well, the world flooded last week, but now it's better. No, it's about what God intends. The truth that you and I feel in that 
as we go through our lives. There's also this little tiny gospel story that we get this morning. Unfortunately, it's sort of the bargain Cliff Notes version of the story of the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness. We don't get all the temptations of Satan with all their lurid details about what it is the devil would promise us. Nonetheless, the, the, the essentials are there. There is Jesus' own story, this person who, whatever he may have known about himself, and we can't be sure what he would have known about himself, who has come to be baptized, begin his public work, his public ministry, who's had this, this immediate, overwhelming experience of the presence of God telling him, you are my beloved, I'm pleased with you, now get busy. Who among us wouldn't want to go away for a little time after that to try to figure out what in the world that means? Who in the world wouldn't want to go to a silent place without any distractions to begin to plot out what comes next? And that's what Jesus does. He, he goes away. He goes into the desert to begin to figure out who this new person is that he's supposed to become. In that also is our story. We who together are always discerning what it is that God intends for us. And how often we fail to stop and be quiet. To try to sort out those details before we go rushing into them. How often are we not quite ready to hear that voice coming down from heaven saying, You are my beloved, you the church, now get busy. how much easier it is to be distracted with the details, how much easier it is to be distracted with the busyness than with that sorting out. And then there is also God's story in this, that day by day as we go through our lives, God is speaking to us. How many times does God speak in a somewhat less dramatic fashion perhaps than in the story this morning? And we miss it entirely. How often do we fail to hear that voice? Even when it's the voice just saying, I love you. Not even, here's what I want you to do. Just, I love you. How often do we not even hear that? All of this, dear friends, should bear in upon us as we begin our journey this year in Lent. It's very, very easy in Lent to make it all about me. What I am giving up, what I am going to start doing, the sins I need to work on, how I am going to be different, I, 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 I. When in reality, it's more about making ourselves better able to hear God's story speaking in our own lives, in our own hearts. This probably is the best time. We should be doing it every day of our lives, make no mistake. This nonetheless is probably the best chance we get to actually make that happen. To look at our own story and God's story and see where they align and where they don't. To begin to imagine how it is that God's story is really what we're supposed to be following. What is supposed to be enlivening and guiding our own lives. So I challenge you as we go through the next six weeks, as each one of us goes through the next six weeks, to listen for the story of God playing out in your life, my life, our life. Look for ways that perhaps we too can be better in line with it. If we can do that, only that, imagine how much more joyful we will be when we arrive yet again at Easter. Let that be our prayer. Let that be our work. Amen.